Hey folks, in this video we're going to examine the cross product, also known as the vector product, in three-dimensional space. Apologies for the clickbait title on YouTube, but I'm hoping this one will make me a superstar like Gary Busey. In what follows we work in the oriented inner product space R3. I assume you're already familiar with the inner product or dot product. We choose the familiar right-hand orientation of the space. So the standard basis E1, E2, E3, as seen here, is considered positively oriented. With your right hand, if you point your index finger in the direction of E1, and your middle finger in the direction of E2, then your thumb points up in the direction of E3. That is, if you have fingers. If you have shoehorns for hands or something, you'll need to seek the assistance of a friend or loved one. With that out of the way, let delta be the normal determinant function on the oriented space R3. In my video on determinants and volume, I showed that delta of xyz measures the oriented or signed volume of the parallelopiped formed by the vectors x, y, and z, as seen here. Deltas being normal means that delta of e1, e2, e3 equals 1. This implies that delta assigns the oriented volume 1 to any positively oriented unit cube, which is a natural condition. Also, delta of x, y, z is positive if and only if x, y, and z are positively oriented. As a determinant function, delta is multilinear and alternating. Being multilinear means it's linear in each of the arguments x, y, and z when the other two are held fixed. Being alternating means it's equal to zero when two of the arguments are equal to each other, or equivalently, it changes sign when two of the arguments are interchanged. We introduce the cross product using delta. For fixed vectors x and y, consider the function f from r3 to r defined by f of z equals delta of x, y, z. Then f is linear since delta is multilinear. So by duality, there's a unique vector v with f of z equal to v times z under the inner product for all z. Here we denote the inner product using parentheses. Recall duality tells us that the map which sends a vector w to the linear function w times blank under the inner product is a natural isomorphism from R3 to the space of linear functions on R3. So in particular f, which is a linear function, is the image under this map of a unique vector, which we're calling v. For more on duality, see my video on duality and linear algebra. The vector v, like f, depends upon x and y. We write v as x cross y. Then from the above, we have that x cross y times z equals delta of x, y, z for all vectors x, y, and z. This equation defines x cross y. Taking z equal to x and then z equal to y in the equation, it follows from the alternating property of delta that x cross y times x equals 0 and x cross y times y equals 0. So x cross y is orthogonal to both x and y. Taking z equal to x cross y in the equation, we see that the norm of x cross y squared, which equals x cross y times itself, is equal to delta of x y x cross y. It follows from this equation that if x and y are linearly dependent, then x cross y must be 0, because in that case the volume on the right-hand side is 0. On the other hand, if x and y are linearly independent, then we know there is a vector z with x cross y times z equal to delta of x, y, z non-zero, so x cross y must be non-zero. In the latter case, it follows from the equation above that the vectors x, y, and x cross y, in that order, are positively oriented, because delta of x, y, x cross y is the square of a real number, which is always positive. Also, if we divide both sides of the equation by the norm of x cross y, we see that the norm of x cross y equals delta of x, y, and the vector x cross y over the norm of x cross y. But that last vector is a unit vector orthogonal to x and y, and delta measures volume. So this is just the area of the parallelogram formed by x and y. If you saw my last video on the Gramian, you'll know it follows from this that the norm of x cross y squared equals the Gramian of x and y, which by definition is the 2 by 2 determinant of inner products seen here. This determinant expands like this. 
We describe the connection between x cross y and the inner product x times y by saying that x cross y is compatible with the metric. All of this justifies the familiar definition of the cross product. The cross product x cross y is the vector orthogonal to x and y, with direction making the vectors x, y, and x cross y in that order positively oriented, and with length equal to the area of the parallelogram formed by x and y, where it's understood here that x cross y is zero when x and y are linearly dependent and the parallelogram formed is degenerate. Here's what the cross product looks like under the right-hand orientation of the space. If we had chosen the left-hand orientation of the space, the cross product would appear in the opposite direction. So great, we've arrived at the definition of the cross product. But after seeing it, you might wonder, why is this definition so weird? I mean, who would have ever thought to define a vector this way? And why would they have ever thought it would be useful? Which it is, by the way, extremely useful. It's possible to give a historical answer to this question, saying something about Hamilton's discovery and obsession with quaternions, and Gibbs and Wolverine's subsequent development of vector algebra, but I'm not in the mood for history today, so I'll give a conceptual answer. The weirdness stems from the fact that the vector x cross y is dual to the oriented area of the parallelogram formed by x and y within the oriented space. By oriented area here, I don't just mean a positive or negative number. I mean a two-dimensional oriented geometric object, like a vector is a one-dimensional oriented geometric object. It can be visualized like this. Through duality, x cross y represents or encodes the oriented area as an oriented length in the space. Now it's not difficult to see that oriented area is an important concept. It arises in many theoretical and applied problems. So having a way to represent it as a vector which can be manipulated through algebraic operations is extremely useful. But that's not the most natural approach. It's actually more natural to represent oriented area itself, and oriented volume for that matter, as a new type of object in a larger space. This idea leads to the subjects of exterior algebra and geometric algebra, which extend ordinary vector algebra. However, we're not going to enter into those in this video. We now examine the algebraic properties of the cross product operation. First, the operation is bilinear. That is, x plus y cross z equals x cross z plus y cross z. x cross y plus z equals x cross y plus x cross z. And alpha x cross y equals alpha times x cross y, which equals x cross alpha y. These equations follow from multilinearity of the determinant function delta and definiteness of the inner product. The first two show that the cross product distributes over addition, while the third shows that it's compatible with scalar multiplication. For this reason, R3 is said to form an algebra under the cross product. The operation is also anti-commutative, that is, y cross x equals minus x cross y. This equation follows from the alternating property of the determinant function delta. It tells us that if we interchange the order of the vectors x and y, the cross product points in the opposite direction, like this. Surprisingly, the cross product operation is non-associative, unlike most familiar products. For example, these two products are not equal. The one on the left is zero, while the one on the right is non-zero, as you can easily verify. However, it satisfies the Jacobi identity, which is the next best thing. Because of anti-commutativity and the Jacobi identity, R3 is said to form a Lie algebra under the cross product. This is named after the Norwegian mathematician Sophus Lie, who in addition to being an expert on this type of algebra, was also a connoisseur of beard oil. Okay, I guess I was in the mood for some history today after all. If we write the vectors x and y in terms of coordinates, it follows from the algebraic properties of the cross product that we can compute the vector x cross y like this. This is sometimes written as a formal 3 by 3 determinant like this so that it's easier to remember. But it's not a regular determinant because the e's are vectors while the alphas and betas are scalars. The cross product is closely connected to skew symmetric maps. 
These maps have important applications, for example in the study of rotations. Let phi be a linear map on R3. Let phi star denote the metric adjoint of phi. The defining property of the metric adjoint is that phi x times y equals x times phi star y for all vectors x and y. To get more intuition about this, see my video on duality in linear algebra. There I explain how if we think of a linear map on R3 like a complex number, which induces a linear map of the complex plane through multiplication, then this adjoint is like the complex conjugate. Phi is called skew symmetric if phi star equals minus phi. That is, phi x times y equals minus x times phi y for all x and y. This condition is equivalent to the condition that phi x times x equals zero for all x. Under the complex number analogy, skew symmetric maps are like purely imaginary numbers. For a vector v, define the map phi v by phi v of x equals v cross x. Then phi v is linear since the cross product is bilinear. And phi v is also skew symmetric since phi v x times x equals v cross x times x, which equals zero for all x. Conversely, and importantly, if phi is skew symmetric, then phi equals phi v for a unique vector v. To see this, first observe that the function big phi defined by big phi of xy equals phi x times y is bilinear and alternating since phi is skew symmetric. So it's a two-dimensional determinant function on R3. Geometrically, this means it measures oriented area in planes in R3. But in my video on determinants and volume, I showed that any function which measures oriented area in planes in R3 actually measures oriented volume relative to a fixed vector. So there's a vector v with big phi of xy equal to delta of vxy. This means that phi x times y equals delta of vxy, which equals v cross x times y, which equals phi vx times y. Since this holds for all vectors x and y, it follows from definiteness of the inner product that phi equals phi v. Isn't that a slick proof? It follows from this theorem that the map which sends a vector v to the map phi v is an isomorphism from the vector space R3 to the vector space of skew symmetric maps on R3. But more is true. The skew symmetric maps on R3 themselves form a Lie algebra under the Lie product seen here, where phi times psi equals the composite phi after psi minus the composite psi after phi. You can easily verify yourself that this product preserves skew symmetry and is bilinear, anti-commutative, and satisfies the Jacobi identity. It follows from the Jacobi identity for the cross product that phi v cross w equals the Lie product phi v times phi w. So the map which sends v to phi v is actually an isomorphism of Lie algebras. We'll return to this in a moment when we consider generalizations of the cross product. The cross product also interacts in interesting ways with other linear maps. Again, let phi be a linear map on R3. Let adj phi denote the classical adjoint of phi. I covered the classical adjoint in my video on determinants of linear maps, where it was seen to have important applications. It's different from the metric adjoint and is sometimes called the adjugate or the adjunct instead. It's defined by the equation seen here which says that delta of phi x phi y z equals delta of x y adj phi z for all vectors x, y, and z. Now, we have that phi x cross phi y equals adj phi star of x cross y. This theorem describes what happens when we apply a linear map to two vectors before taking their cross product. To prove it, observe that phi x cross phi y times z equals delta of phi x phi y z, which equals delta of x y adj phi z, which equals x cross y times adj phi z, which equals adj phi star of x cross y times z. Since this holds for all vectors z, the result follows by definiteness of the inner product. Notice this theorem also provides a geometric description of the classical adjoint. 
Very loosely, that description says that the classical adjoint of phi transforms any parallelogram by transforming its edges according to phi. This shows that when working in three-dimensional space, it's more natural to describe the operation of the classical adjoint on two-dimensional areas than on one-dimensional vectors. Here's another theorem which describes what happens when we apply an invertible linear map after taking the cross product of two vectors. The proof of this one is similar to the last one, so I'll leave it to you. While you're at it, you should try to come up with a concise geometric description of the result. If you succeed, let me know in the comments. The cross product is essentially unique to R3. Intuitively, this is because R3 is the only space in which length is dual to area. As we saw, the cross product represents or encodes two-dimensional oriented area as one-dimensional oriented length through duality. This is only possible in a space of dimension 3 because 2 plus 1 equals 3. Formally, we have a theorem. The only n for which Rn forms a non-trivial Lie algebra compatible with the metric is n equal to 3. However, we saw earlier that when n is equal to 3, the Lie algebra is isomorphic to the Lie algebra of skew-symmetric maps on R3. In general, we can consider the Lie algebra of skew-symmetric maps on Rn for any n. So this provides one way of generalizing the cross product. We can also define a cross product in R7 if we're willing to drop the Jacobi identity. In this case, cross product just means a bilinear vector product which is compatible with the metric. But that's it, aside from R3, at least if we're looking for a product of two vectors. We can define a vector product of n minus 1 vectors in Rn in almost exactly the same way we defined the cross product of two vectors in R3. To do this, let delta be the normal determinant function on the oriented space Rn. For fixed vectors x1 to xn minus 1, it follows from the same reasoning we saw earlier that there's a unique vector v with v times x equal to delta of x1 to xn minus 1 x for all vectors x. It follows that v is orthogonal to the vectors x1 to xn minus 1. The vectors x1 to xn minus 1 v, in that order, are positively oriented. And the norm of v is the n minus 1 dimensional volume of the parallelepiped formed by x1 to xn minus 1. So the induced product operation is compatible with the metric. Additionally, the operation is multilinear and alternating since delta is, and is non-associative. So while the cross product is essentially unique to R3, we can generalize it in different ways depending upon what we're willing to give up. Maybe the cross product isn't so weird, after all. Here are the references I used while making this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like and subscribe and leave comments so I can become a YouTube celebrity. Thanks for watching.